Shuffer Bounds for Uniformly Stable Algorithms. This paper is by Olivia Bousquet, who is at Google Research Zurich, Igor Klachkov, who is at the University of Cambridge, and Nikita Zhivatovsky, who is also at Google Research Zurich, and who is presenting this work. So we'll start with the following fundamental question. So the first one is, when does the learning algorithm generalize? And the second, which we can see as a particular case of the first one, when is the test error close to the empirical error? Because in general, we know how to minimize the empirical error, but of course, it doesn't imply that the test error will be also small. So these two questions uh, form the core of the statistical learning theory in some sense. Let us introduce some history. So of course, the in order to prove uh, the generalization bounds, uh, there are several approaches. Maybe the first one is the so-called uniform convergence, which was introduced by Vavnik and Chervanenkis. And the second one, which we may uh, always recall, is the stability. So informally, it works as follows. So the algorithm is stable. If it has low sensitivity with respect to changes in, say, only one during example. Uh, surprisingly, this idea can also be attributed to Vapnik and Chumanenkis. So in their 1974 book, they presented uh, the thing that we now know uh, as the hard margin SVM. So assume that I have uh, the linearly separable two groups of points, blue and green. Then I uh, create the or run the so-called hard margin SVM, which uh, creates a separator marked by red, which maximizes the margin between these two groups. And it's well known there is a small number of these so-called uh, support vectors. And what is the key observation is that if I remove from the sample any object that is not in the support set, so any of these two uh, green or blue points separated from the red line, then the output algorithm doesn't change at all. So in this sense, the algorithm is stable, and this allowed Wapnik and Chernenkis to prove that the expected risk of this hard margin SVM uh, scales as d dimension over the sample size back in the 70s. We will use a closely related notion of stability, the so-called uniform stability. Let S define and note our learning sample, AS be a learning algorithm, and L denote our loss function. For any predictor f, let rf be our true risk, where the expectation is taken with respect to any pair x, y. And uh, our emp is our empirical error, which is defined as the sum of errors of a given predictor f with respect to uh, the given sample s. So we also define si. It's a sample s where we replace x, i, y, i by x i prime, y i prime. So any point which is different from the original point. And uh, the notion of uniform stability is the following. We say that the learning algorithm is uniformly stable with parameter gamma. So this gamma may depend on various parameters. For example, it may depend on the sample size. So we say that the algorithm is uniformly stable if uh, the loss of the algorithm trained uh, on the sample s and tested at any point x, y, minus the loss of uh, the same algorithm, which is by, but trained on the sample with one point replaced and tested on the same point x, y, changes by at most gamma with respect to the worst case choice of the sample, of the sample replaced by one point, and the test point. So there are numerous examples uh, and numerous algorithms that satisfy this uniform stability. So for example, the regularized regression, soft margin SVM under some additional assumptions, uh, which can be traced back to Bousquet and Yelisev 2002. So more recent results are for the Hasting gradient method by Hart, Resch, and Singer 2016. And of course, right now it's well known that the notion of uniform stability has close relations to uh, differential privacy. Uh, let us uh, recall some uh, well-known results on uniform stability. So the following bound is uh, classical and was first presented by Bousquet and Gelisave and is based on the um, bounded difference inequality. So for uniformly stable algorithm, uh, if uh, the loss is bounded by capital L, 
Then with uh, probability at least one minus delta, the generalization error scales as the sum of these two terms. The first term corresponds to the uh, stability, so it depends on gamma. And the second term uh, represents uh, the sampling error, so it doesn't depend on gamma at all. Uh, let us consider one particular regime, for example, when uh, L is equal to one, so the losses are bounded by one, and the stability parameter scales as one over N. Uh, this bound uh, immediately implies that the risk of the algorithm minus the empirical risk of this algorithm scales as one over square root of N, which is the best one can hope for because it's exactly the sampling error. The problem of this bound is that it contains this ad additional square root of N factor marked in red, and we may see that nothing interesting happens if gamma is, say, 1 over square root of n. The right hand side of the bound is that constant, but we expect that it should converge to zero as n goes to infinity. Now, very recently, uh, Feldman and Wondrek provided two groundbreaking papers in this area. They provided uh, two hyperability upper bounds, which are usually sharper than the original bound of Bosquet and Yelisev. Their first analysis is based on differential privacy techniques, and it, it replaces this gamma square root of n term by square root of gamma L term. So there is no uh, problematic square root of n term anymore, but at the same time, the problem with this bound is that gamma is expected to be relatively small, but here we take a square root of gamma. So actually it's, it can be as sharp as we, as we want it to be. But more recently, in their 2019 paper, they produced a bound which is almost always sharper than the, their first one. So the idea is that up to some logarithmic factors, it doesn't contain the square root of gamma anymore. It doesn't contain the square root of n, which appeared in the bound of Busquets and Yelisev. So, but it contains a diff, slightly different uh, dependence on the uh, logarithm on one over delta, so it's slightly weaker in this in this sense. So the first bound cannot be omitted for free because there are some regimes where the original bound um, is slightly better. And uh, the authors Feldman and Vondrak also ask two natural questions. So are there sharper bounds, and uh, is it possible to provide high probability lower bounds? So we did some uh, advances in this. Uh, questions. Uh, and uh, the first one is the corollary of our general result. So we proved in particular that it's possible to remove this gamma log n squared factor uh, and to achieve this slightly sharper generalization bound. Let us approach our general analysis. So our proof technique uh, is based on the analysis of the moments of random variables. So we can usually and easily recall the LP norm of a random variable. And then uh, the following nice relation holds. So if we can prove for random variable that its LP moment scales at the sum of the term scaling as square root of P, the so-called sub-Gaussian regime, and P, which is the so-called sub-exponential regime, then with high probability, this random variable uh, is controlled by the square root of log, log one over delta term, which corresponds where delta is our confidence, plus uh, the second term, which corresponds to a so-called sub-exponential regime, log one over delta, without the square root of. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, before we proceed, and these two notions are uh, equivalent. Before we proceed, let us recall uh, the notion of uh, bounded difference. So the, we say that the function g has a bounded difference property. Uh, if for any, if by changing one parameter, like xi for one variable, xi by xi prime, the function changes by at most beta. And our result is the following general concentration inequality. So we prove the following. Assume that z is a vector of and independent random variables, and assume that we are given n functions. The number of functions is the same as the number of random variables, and uh, these functions satisfy the following three properties. 
The first one is that if we take the expectation with respect to all except the if random variable, then the uh, given this random variable is bounded by M, capital M with probability one. If we take the expectation with respect to only the if variable, if variable, then this, this expectation is equal to zero. We also assume that these functions gi all have the bounded difference property with parameter b with respect to all variables except the ith variable. Then for any p greater than two, the moment of the sum of these n functions um, has the following, uh, satisfies the following upper bound. So there are two terms. One of them scales linearly with p, which corresponds to the sub-exponential regime. And the second scale is square root of p, which corresponds to the sub-Gaussian regimes. Surprisingly, both generalization bounds are simple corollaries of this result. And moreover, uh, they, as we discussed before, we can get some uh, log factor improvements. So some details of our approach. So our proof uses the sample splitting approach of Feldman and Wondrak, but there are several important differences. The first one is that uh, instead of concentration inequalities, truncations, and having inequality, we use moment-based inequalities, in particular, marcinkiewicz zygmunt inequality. Then uh, there, so the original recursive structure of the proof of Feldman and Wondrak is replaced uh, in our analysis uh, by certain telescopic sums. As a result, our proof is significantly shorter and uh, our result is slightly sharper. So for example, we can win some logarithmic factors. And our general result simultaneously recovers the bound which was shown in their original paper where the differential privacy techniques. So in some sense, our result recovers both the results and unifies uh, them. Now we proceed with the lower bound of for our concentration inequality. Um, so under the assumptions, uh, our assumptions, we know that uh, the LP norm of the sum of functions GI has this uh, behavior. And our strong theorem says that we can actually match this from below up to logarithmic factor. So there are examples of uh, functions which we call, uh, which are GI functions, uh, satisfying the conditions of our theorem, such that the LP norm of uh, the sum of these functions satisfies the same uh, bound uh, as we have in our, our upper bound, but without uh, the logarithmic factor. So up to this logarithmic factor, the bound is sharp. And in our lower bound, we used a particular case of freedom and chaos of order two. And our analysis leaves several open questions. The first one is the last logarithmic factor. So the question is, is it possible to remove it? Because we have a gap between our upper and lower bounds. And uh, one positive thing about uh, the fact that we can possibly remove this logarithmic factor is that for P, which is equal to two, so that for the second moment, we have a bound that does not contain uh, the logarithmic factor at all, so which is actually sharp. And uh, the more interesting question is, of course, to, to get uh, some kind of stronger lower bounds, because our lower bounds work for our slightly more general theorem. So since our theorem is more general, we have more freedom to construct the lower bound. At the same time, we don't know of any um, natural learning algorithm that satisfy that uh, such that um, from below it matches its behavior matches <clears throat> the known upper bounds. So it's uh, an interesting question of uh, future research. Thank you.